Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to present our study at our school conference. I'm Yunfeng Chen. I'm a visiting scientist at CSIRO, Deep Earth Imaging, Future Science Platform. I'm also a system professor at School of Earth Sciences at Zhejiang University. Today, I'd like to talk about building the next generation size model of the Australian cross with our scope data. Before jumping into details of my talk, I'd like to acknowledge all my co-authors, at least here. In fact, the most recent continent scale model of Australian continent was developed almost 10 years ago by Sigan and Kinnett in 2012. The figure shows the station distribution used in their study, which contains less than 300 stations. And the red figure shows the 8 second group velocity map constructed using the ambient noise imaging method. And it is constructed from about 7,500 repass. And the velocity variation is kind of smooth across the entire continent. The large scale structures are relatively well constrained. However, the lateral resolution is still far from ideal, which is about 300 kilometers or so in their model. There have been some new research opportunities come along with our scope project, and thousands of seismic stations have been deployed over the past 30 years. And more importantly, this data are publicly available and shared among the scientific community. This really established a solid data foundation for conducting various size and imaging projects. And for us, the motivation is kind of straightforward. And we'd like to exploit this exciting data set and to see how we can improve upon the existing model and develop perhaps the next generation size and velocity model of the Australian continent. A mean noise correlation is a widely applied technique to study the crustal structures. And this is a famous figure from Weaver 2005. Here, there are two detectors, and they record some noise waveforms. If we cross correlate these noise waveforms, we can recover the empirical green's functions propagating between the two stations. But the underlying assumption of this method is that the two stations need to be deployed at the same time. In other words, they need to simultaneously record these noise waveforms. Uh, however, this is often not true for station deployment in Australia. And for example, in Southeast Australia, there were many temporary rays with a conventional ambient noise correlation method, or we can call it SIVA method. It can mostly recover the repass uh, for stations within the same networks. However, uh, for those uh, coming from different networks, uh, we cannot recover their repass uh, because those stations are deployed at different times. And for example, for networks deployed in Southeast Australia and those deployed on the Tasmania Islands, there's no repass directly connecting these two regions. And this actually imposes some challenge to existing ambient noise imaging workflow. We would like to address some of these challenges with improvement in both data and methodology. First of all, uh, thanks to the community effort and the scope project, the number of stations increases dramatically over the years, from less than 100 in early 2000 to about 300 in recent years. Among these networks, and those from AU and S1, they form the Blackmore Array, and the figure shows the station distribution from various networks used in this study, which contains more than 1,600 stations and about three decades of seismic data. And in terms of methodology, we tie asynchronous networks with a recently proposed higher order ambient noise imaging workflow. And this workflow is based on the cross correlation of ambient noise correlation functions because it involves two cross correlation operations. We also name it as the C2 method. C2 is actually built on top of the conventional ambient noise correlation or the C1 method. Here A and B are two temporary stations deployed at different times, and the surrounding blue triangles can represent some long operating stations, and their deployment times are overlapped with both A and B. For example, in Australia, they can be the backbone array, such as the AU and S1 networks. The first step is just a conventional ambient noise correlation. We cross correlate the ambient noise recorded at A and permanent station and B and permanent station. This effective turns these permanent stations into virtual sources. In the second step, we select two C1 functions from a common virtual source and cross correlate two C1 functions. And this gives us an individual C2 functions. 
and then they can repeat this process for all virtual sources that were formed within the station phase zone, uh, which is represented by the shades. And the stack of all individual C2 functions give us a final estimate of C2, which is approximation of the empirical Green's function between these two uh, temporal stations. It worth noting that in this whole process, we never explicitly compute the empirical Green's function between these two temporal stations. And Rather, we use the permanent stations as a bridge to tie these two asynchronous stations together. And this forms the foundation for our uh, higher order ambient noise imaging workflow. To actually show how this method works, we select a station in Southeast Australia and apply both C1 and C2 method to extract empirical green functions. In general, their waveforms are very similar, both showing clear surface energy from uh, 0 up to 3,500 kilometers. And some of the detailed waveform characteristics are also similar. For example, at far offset, both of them show this kind of surface wave multiples. However, at certain distances, we can only recover the empirical green function using the C2 method, for example, as highlighted by these two rectangles. And this additional repass can help to improve the repass coverage in subsequent ambient noise, uh, ambient noise imaging process. Here we show comparison of imaging results. The top row shows the group velocity at 5 seconds from C1, C2, and their combination, respectively. The bottom show shows the corresponding repass density plot. In general, the imaging results are quite similar because of the large data set used in this study. However, the improvement is most significant in regions where C1 has a relatively low data coverage, for example, in the circled area. The low velocity structures are better recovered in the C2 result. And the combined data set has much higher data uh, coverage than those from individual data sets alone. And as expected, the combined, the inversion results from the combined data set includes the details from these two individual images. This is our velocity model at shallow depths, for example, at one kilometer. We observe large velocity variation across continent from high velocity Western Australia to low velocity Central and Eastern Australia. In general, these low velocities are correlated well with the location of known sedimentary basins. This includes both broader basins in central and eastern parts of the model and smaller basins near the coastline as well as the offshore region. The red figure shows for cross-sectional view of our model. Low velocity basins dominate the upper 10 kilometer of the model. At greater depths, our model reveals a clear transition from intermediate to high velocities. The white line indicates the molehole extracted from our model, which is approximated by a constant velocity contour. The black dashed line is molehole depth extracted from our molehole, which is a reference molehole model of Australia. And in general, these two lines show good agreement in most parts of the model. Here shows the basin structure. The left figure shows the size and velocity in the upper 5 km of the crust. These squares mark the location of mines, and black dots are the mineral deposit locations. There are some interesting correlations between size and velocities and mineral deposits. Specifically, the majority of the mineral deposits are found in high velocity areas or near the edges of low velocity region. This can be explained by either a preferential distribution of mineral deposits, or simply suggest that lots of deposits are still deeply buried beneath the cover and have not been found yet. It could also map the spatial distribution and thickness of the sedimentary cover, as shown in the uh, middle panel. And the right figure shows the sedimentary thickness from the OZC base model, which is constructed from combined geophysical and geological data sets. Although our model is constrained by using ambient noise data alone, there is still a good agreement between these two maps. And this suggests that ambient noise tomography can be a very useful tool to map the basin structures. In conclusion, we compiled the large seismic data set to conduct ambient noise imaging of the Australian continent. The C2 workflow enables retrieving surface waves between asynchronous stations and networks, which greatly improves the repass coverage. And this high-resolution shared velocity model can 
provides some new constraints on cross structures and hopefully can be used as a new basis for the community model of Australian cross. And finally, uh, this work is not possible without decades of data collection efforts made by seismological community in Australia. I'd like to thank OSCOPE, OSPAS, based at Australian National University, Geoscience Australia, University of Melbourne, and University of Western Australia for collecting and sharing the seismic data. And thank you for your attention.